Welcome, everybody. It's great to have you here. Can I uh, ask that everybody now please ensure that they're on mute? And uh, also, I recommend that you turn your video to speaker view. And, um, and like last night, and when on speaker view, suggest hide thumbnails as because the share screen with the images will be on for m most, if not all, of the service as we will be following uh, prayers and readings together. Sometimes the leader of worship will invite you to say together the prayer or the reading, and we invite you to join along. But please keep yourself on mute um, the whole time. So welcome everybody and thank you for uh, Jeff and Joanna who are leading most of this service. It's um, And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to now hand over to Joanna. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that only so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life john 3:16 jesus you are our great high priest who has passed from heaven to earth to intercede for us in every way you were tested as we are but you did not sin we take this time to honour you, to remember your great act of love. And as we come, we pray that our hearts are changed, that we can never be the same again, that we receive your love and with your help, that we commit ourselves to following you completely. So today we are listening to the story and following Jesus' journey to the cross. And we're going to begin with a song, The Power of the Cross. Jesus said, the Son of Man came not to serve, but to be, not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Holy God, your love is astounding. As we gather at the foot of the cross today, we are aware that we have done nothing to earn your love. It is you who reach into our life and draw us to yourself. You sent Jesus, our brother, to teach us and save us. In the depths of his pain and his dying, Jesus spoke these words of comfort and release, of lamentation and love to those around him. Forgive. You will be with me. Behold forsaken, thirst, finished, into your hands. He knew that these were his last words, but not his final ones. That after this, there would be a span of silence and that soon the silence would come to an end. For now, we watch, we weep, we bear witness, we wait. Teach us again today that there is no limit to your love and no exclusion zone to your salvation. Amen. So in the scriptures, the death of the Messiah is foretold a number of times, but none is so confronting as the poetic song of the suffering servant found in Isaiah 52 and 53. 
See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him and kings stand speechless before him, for they shall see something never told and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard and to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up before us, like a root in arid ground. Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes. A thing despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. A man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we, we thought of him as someone punished struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law, he was taken would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our faults struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong and there was no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering if he offers his life in atonement, he will see his heirs. He shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. The soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings, By his sufferings, my servant shall justify many, taking their faults upon himself. Hence, I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and by letting himself be taken for a sinner. While he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the while for sinners. What prayers Jesus said on the day of his death are known only to him and the Father. Yet as one having been taught, learnt and chanted the Psalms in the synagogue worship from his youth and in his own personal family prayers, it's not hard to imagine that he may have remembered and prayed Psalm 23 on this day. So I invite you to join with me 
in praying this psalm. Can you, before we do, just please double check that everyone is on mute? I'm just hearing a little bit of background noise. Someone may have accidentally put their um, volume, their mic back on. So just please check that everyone's on mute. And when you've done that, I invite you to share with me in saying these powerful words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. So in that last song, we were invited to come wash our guilt away. And um, one way that we can do this is to pray this prayer of repentance and healing, which is well known to all of us, Jesus too, Psalm 51. So we invite you at home to join along and pray this prayer with me. Have mercy on me, God, in your kindness. In your compassion, blot out my offence. Oh, wash me more and more from my guilt and cleanse me from my sins. My offences, truly I know them. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned. What is evil in your sight, I have done. That you may be justified when you give sentence and be without reproach when you judge. O oh, see, in the guilt, guilt I was born, a sinner was I conceived. Indeed, you love truth in the heart. Then in the secret of my heart, teach me wisdom. O oh, purify me, then I shall be clean. O oh, wash me, then I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear rejoicing and gladness, that the bones you have crushed may thrill. From my sins, turn away your face and blot out all my guilt. A pure heart create for me, O oh God. Put a steadfast spirit within me, that I may teach transgressors your ways, and sinners may return to you. O oh, rescue me, God, my helper, and my tongue shall ring out your goodness. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. For in sacrifice you took no delight. Burnt offerings from me you would refuse. My sacrifice, a contrite spirit. A humbled, contrite heart you will not spurn. We are going to hear Matthew's Passion. And as we do so, I'd invite you to not only listen with the ears of your mind, but the ears of your heart and your spirit. We're going to share chapter 26 and 27. Jesus had now finished all he wanted to say 
And he said to his disciples, as you know, it will be Passover in two days time and the son of man will be handed over to be crucified. Meanwhile, the chief priests and the elders of the people had assembled in the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest, and made plans to arrest Jesus by some trick. However, they said, it must not be during the festivities. There must be no disturbance among the people. Now, Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, when a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of the most expensive <laughs> ointment. And she poured this on his head as he was seated at table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant and said, Why this waste? This ointment could have been sold for a high price and the money given to the poor. Jesus noticed this and he said to them, Why are you upsetting the woman? Indeed, what she has done for me is one of the good works. I, you will have the poor with you always but you will not always have me. When she poured this ointment on my body, she did it to prepare me for my burial. I tell you solemnly, wherever the good news is shared or anywhere in the world, what she has done for me will also be told in remembrance of her. Then one of the 12, Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, oh, what are you prepared to give to me? If I hand him over to you, and they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, Judas looked for an opportunity to betray Jesus. Now, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Where do you want us to make the preparation for you to keep the Passover? And Jesus told them, Go into the city and meet a certain man and say to him, The master says, it, My time is near. It is at your house that I am keeping Passover with my disciples. The disciples did what Jesus told them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus was at table with the 12 disciples. And while they were eating, Jesus said to them, I tell you solemnly, one of you is about to betray me. And they were greatly distressed and started asking Jesus, not I, Lord, surely not I. And Jesus answered, someone who has dipped his hand into the dish with me will betray me. Ah, the son of man is going to his fate, as the scriptures say he will. But alas, for the man by whom the son of man is betrayed, better for that man never to have been born. Judas, who was to betray him, asked Jesus in his turn, surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered him, they are your own words, Judas. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And when he had said the blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said to them, take it, eat it. This is my body. Then Jesus took a cup and when he had returned, thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink all of you from this. For this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. From now on, I tell you, I will not drink wine until the day I drink wine with you in the kingdom of my Father. After they had sung the Psalms, they left for the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all lose faith in me this night, for the scripture says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after my resurrection, I shall go before you to Galilee. But at this, Peter said, though everyone else might lose faith in you, I will never lose faith. But Jesus answered him, Ah, oh, Peter, Peter, I told you solemnly, tonight and even before the cock crows, you will have to zone me three times. And Peter said to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the disciples said the same. Then Jesus went with them to a small garden called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, stay here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee with him. And a deep sadness came over him and a great distress. And he said to them, my soul is sorrowful to the point of death. Wait here and keep awake with me. 
And going on a little further, Jesus fell down face first onto the ground and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, that it be as you, not I, would have it. He came back to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, So you weren't strong enough to stay awake with me even for one hour. You should be awake and praying not to be put to the test. Ah, oh, the spirit is willing, but the flesh, ah, oh, the flesh is weak. Jesus went away a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot pass me by without my drinking it, your will be done. Jesus came back again and once again found them asleep. Ah, oh, my friends, their eyes were so heavy. Leaving them there, Jesus went away again. And for a third time, he prayed the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, You can sleep now and take your rest. For now the hour has come when the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Come on, get up. Get up, let us go. My betrayer is already close at hand. Jesus was still speaking when Judas, one of the twelve, appeared, and with him was a large number of men armed with swords and clubs and sent by the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now Judas, the traitor, had arranged a sign with them. And he had said to them, The one I kiss, he's the man. Take him in charge. So Judas went straight up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And then he kissed Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Oh, Judas, my friend, do what you are here for. Then they came forward and seized Jesus and took him in charge. At that, one of the followers, Jesus, grasped his sword and drew it. He struck out at the high priest, cutting off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Put your sword back, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think I cannot appeal to my father? who would promptly send 12 legions of angels to my defense. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say this is the way it must be? It was at this time that Jesus said to the crowds, Am I a brigand? Am I a brigand that you had to set out to capture me with swords and clubs? I sat teaching in the temple day after day, and you never laid hands on me. Now all this happened to fulfill the prophecies in Scripture. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. The men who had arrested Jesus led him off to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Peter followed him at a distance. And when he reached the high priest's palace, he went in and sat down with the attendants to see what the end would be. Now the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus, however false, on which they might pass the death sentence. But they couldn't find any, though several lying witnesses did come forward and eventually two stepped forward and made a statement. This man said, I have power to destroy the temple of God and in three days build it up. The high priest then stood up and said to Jesus, Have you no answer to that? What is this evidence these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I put you on oath by the living God to tell us if you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered, the words are your own. And moreover, I tell you that from this time onward, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. At this, the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has blasphemed. What need of witnesses have we now? There, you have just heard the blasphemy. What is your opinion? And they answered, He deserves to die. And they spat in his face, and they hit him with their fists. And others said as they hit him, Ha, ah, play the prophet Christ, who hit you then? Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. 
and a servant girl came up to him and said, you too will be Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it in front of them all saying, I don't know what you're talking about. When Peter went out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to the people who were standing there, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, and this time with an oath, Peter denied it saying, I do not know the man. A little later, the bystanders came up to Peter and said to him, well, you're one of them for sure. Why, even your accent gives you away. Then Peter started calling down curses on himself and swearing, I do not know the man. And at that moment, the cock crew. And Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Ah, oh, Peter, Peter, tonight and before the cock crows, you will have disowned me three times. And Peter went outside and wept bitterly. When morning came, all the chief priests and elders of the people met in the council to bring about the death of Jesus. They had him bound and then led him away to hand him over to Pilate. But when he found out that Jesus had been condemned, Judas, his betrayer, was filled with remorse. And he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the chief priests and elders and said, I have sinned. I have betrayed innocent blood. The chief priest replied, what is that to us? That's your concern. Then Judas threw the 30 pieces of silver into the sanctuary and then he ran off and then he, and then he went and hanged himself. The chief priest picked up the 30 pieces of silver and said, it is against the law to put this money into the treasury. It's blood money. So they discussed the matter and they bought the potter's field with it as a graveyard for foreigners. And that is why it is called the field of blood to this day. And the words of the prophet Jeremiah were then fulfilled. And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the sum at which the precious one was priced by the children of Israel, and they gave them the potter's field, just as the Lord directed me. Pilate was then brought before, Jesus was then brought before Pilate, the Roman governor, and Pilate put to him this question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, it is you who say it. But, when Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he refused to answer at all. And Pilate said to Jesus, do you not hear how many charges they have brought against you? But to Pilate's complete amazement, Jesus offered no reply to any of the charges. Now, at festival time, it was the governor's practice to release a prisoner for the people, or anyone they chose. Now, there was at that time a notorious prisoner whose name was Barabbas. My friends, did you know that in Hebrew, the name Barabbas means son of the father? There was this notorious prisoner whose name was Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For Pilate knew he was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. Now, as Pilate was seated in the chair of judgment, his wife sent him a message, have nothing to do with this man. I have been upset all day by a dream I had about him. Have nothing to do with this man. The chief priests and the elders, however, had persuaded the crowd to demand the release of Barabbas and the execution of Jesus. So when the governor spoke and asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? The crowd called out Barabbas. Pilate then said to them, but in that case, what am I to do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? And the crowd yelled out, let him be crucified. Why, what harm has he done? Asked Pilate, but they just shouted all the louder, crucify him, let him be crucified. Pilate saw that he was making no impression. And in fact, that a riot was imminent. So he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your concern. Oh dear. And, and the people to a man shouted back, 
his blood be upon us and upon our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. Then Pilate ordered Jesus to be flogged and then handed over to be crucified. The governor's soldiers took Jesus with them into the praetorium and collected the whole cohort around him. Then they stripped him naked and made him wear a scarlet cloak. And having twisted some thorns into a crown, they put this on his head and they placed a reed in his right hand. And to make fun of him, they knelt down in front of him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and they took the reed and they struck him on the head with it. When they had finished making fun of him, they took off the cloak, dressed him in his own clothes, and then took him away to crucify him. On their way out, they came across Simon, a man from Cyrene, and they enlisted him to carry the cross of Jesus. And when they had reached Golgotha, which was called the place of the skull, the place where the Romans executed our people, they gave Jesus a drink, a drink of wine, but wine mixed with gall, which as you know is a narcotic which Jesus tasted, but he refused to drink it. When they'd finished crucifying Jesus, they shared out his clothing. They gambled for them by casting lots, and they sat down and stayed there, keeping guard over him. And above the head of Jesus was placed a sign with a charge against him written on it. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At the same time, two robbers are crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. The passers-by jeered at him. They shook their heads and said, So, you destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Then save yourself. If your God's son come down from the cross, the chief priests together, the scribes and the elders mocked him in the same way, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Well, let him come down from the cross now and we'll believe in him. He puts his trust in God. Now let God rescue him, if God wants him. For did he not say, I am the son of God? And even the two robbers who were crucified with him taunted him in the same way. From the sixth hour, there was darkness over the, all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? When some of those who stood there heard this, they said, the man is calling on Elijah. And one of them quickly ran to get a sponge, which he dipped in vinegar and putting it on a reed, gave it to Jesus to drink. But the rest of them said, no, wait, wait, let's see if Elijah will come to save him. But Jesus, crying out in a loud voice, yielded up his spirit and died. At that moment, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks split and the tombs opened and the bodies of holy men rose from the dead. And after Jesus' resurrection, these men came out of the tombs, entered the holy city and appeared to a number of people. Meanwhile, the centurion, together with the others guarding Jesus, had seen the earthquake and all that was taking place and they were terrified and said, in truth, this man was a son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. The same women who had faithfully followed Jesus all the way from Galilee and had looked after him. Among them was, was Mary of Magdala. There was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of Zebedee's sons. When it was evening, there came a rich man of Arimathea called Joseph, who had become a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And Pilate ordered the body to be handed over to him. So Joseph took the body and he wrapped it in a clean shroud 
and he put it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a large stone across the entrance and went away. Now Mary of Magdala and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Next day, that is when preparation day was over, the chief priests and the Pharisees went in a body to Pilate and said to him, Ah, your excellency, we recall that this imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I shall rise again. Therefore, give the order to have the tomb kept secure until the third day, for fear his disciples will come, steal him away, and then tell the people that he has risen from the dead. This last piece of fraud will be worse than all that went before. And Pilate said, Then you may have your guard. Go. Go and make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, putting seals on the stone and mounting a guard. Friends, allow that one thing stir deep in your heart and soul to sit with you as a prayer a prayer with the Holy Spirit rising up from deep within don't worry, worry if you can't find the right words the Father knows the cry of your heart and soul. And offer that feeling, that pain, that relief, that joy, that sorrow to rise. Holy God, you sent your son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So we pray to you now for people everywhere. We pray for the church of God throughout the world, for unity in faith, in witness and in service, 
for leaders and ministers and those whom they serve, for all Christians, for those who are mocked and persecuted for their faith. We ask you to strengthen your people in faith, increase their love and give us peace. Help us to serve you in holiness and truth so that we may glorify your name. We pray for all nations of the world and their leaders, for those who administer the law and all who serve in public office, for all who strive for justice and reconciliation. Give them wisdom and compassion and help them deal with the challenges they face so that with your help, all people may live in peace and freedom. We pray for God's ancient people, the Jews, the first to hear his word. We ask you to bless the children of your covenant, both Jew and Christian. Take from us all blindness and bitterness of heart and hasten the coming of your kingdom when Israel will be saved, the Gentiles gathered in, and we will dwell together in mutual love and peace under the one God and Father of Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray for those who do not believe the gospel of Jesus, for those who follow other faiths and creeds, for those who have not heard the message of salvation, for all those who have lost faith, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of Christ and persecute those who follow him, for all who deny the faith of Christ crucified. Merciful God, creator of all people of the earth, have compassion on those who do not know you. Gather them into the one fold of the one shepherd, Jesus, your son. We pray for all who suffer, for those who are deprived and oppressed, for all who are sick and handicapped, for those in darkness, in doubt and in despair, in loneliness and fear, for prisoners, for the victims of false accusations and violence, for all at the point of death and those who watch beside them. Holy God, in your mercy, fill them with the knowledge of your love. Comfort the sad and sorrowful. Strengthen those who suffer. Hear the prayers of your children who cry out of any trouble. And to everyone who is distressed, give mercy, relief and refreshment. We pray for all of your creation, our planet Earth in which we live, this universe with the sun, moon and stars which provide warmth and light and air for our life. The creatures you have placed here with us as companions. The plants which bless us, providing food, shelter, beauty and healing. Continue to watch over your creation and protect it. Fill all people with an understanding that you are the creator of all. Open our eyes to see how we may care for your creation. Open our hearts so that we find the desire and the will to love and care for all that you have made. We pray for ourselves and all your children. We pray for your grace to live our lives fully in union with you. 
We pray that we will always know your presence with us and choose to listen to you. Amen. Amen indeed. And Lord, we also dedicate to you the offering, the offering of ourselves, but the offering of your gifts that have been given electronically or those that have been diligently saved until we meet together again. We offer that to you as an expression and our act of our worship. And we offer all of these prayers to you. Lord, even as we heard uh, those prayers led today, we thought of those. Your Spirit brought to mind those who do not know you, whom we know, those who are unwell and recovering. Thank you, Lord, for the work of your Spirit in their life. All of this we dedicate to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The reflection today from me will take about less than a minute. <laughs> what a gift it was to hear the passion narrative read in its full. Rarely do we do that in worship. Rarely do we hear the full passion narrative. What a gift it was to hear that. How do you sum that up in a few words? I just want to reflect on the words that appeared on our screen at the beginning of this service. It is accomplished. It is finished. Through this act that we recall that happened 2,000 years ago, because of the crucified Christ, death no longer is the end. Because of the crucified Jesus, life is everlasting. Because of what happened, Paul could confidently and con with great conviction record these words that we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39. For I am convinced, he said, that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And dear friends, that is possible because of the uttering of those words of the Saviour, it is is finished. Our service is drawing to a close. I'm going to invite us to pray together the closing prayer that is about to appear on your screen and then we'll sing a beautiful hymn together. This hymn that Joe will lead us in will not be maybe well known but it's beautiful and I invite us to share together. But let's, I invite you to share with me this prayer, which is really based on the words of Philippians 3. Let us say this together. My sisters and brothers, whatever gains and riches I had, all things I thought so important, I have now come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the supreme advantage and value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. All I want is to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, 
and so somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all of this, or that I have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. My sisters and brothers, I do not consider that I have taken hold of it as yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.